Hey everyone, this is Mr. Dunkel. Today we're going to be talking about the labor movement. Uh, many of you are going to be getting jobs pretty soon. Some of you may already have a job, but when you get a job, you are joining the labor force. That means that you're working, you're earning a paycheck and contributing to society. And we're going to go through kind of the history of the labor movement. And I think what you'll find is that you're very fortunate to be getting a job in today's world as opposed to what it was like 100 to 150 years ago. So let's go ahead and get started. Before we get too far into the industrialization labor movement, we want to remind ourselves again of, of cottage industries and what that was like. Another term for that is domestic system. Domestic just simply means home. Uh, and so if you recall when we talked about before the cottage system was basically you know, maybe you farm during the summertime however when it started becoming winter uh, you worked at home in your cottage making goods now there were also people who were trained craftsmen who had special skills that that did things and so you might go to work for one of them you might be an apprentice and you may learn how to become a blacksmith or be a cobbler who works on shoes or things of that nature so in the domestic system you typically knew you know, your employer as well. Uh, they were, you know, people in your community, people that you knew who hired you, took you on as an apprentice, you spent a lot of time with them. And so you had the uh, potential as well of, you know, if you learn a trade and you get really good at your trade, you eventually could, you know, open your own shop or your own business. So uh, workers, you know, had this hope that they could sometimes, you know, later become an employer rather than just an employee. So that's where the system had kind of been. And what we're going to see over the next several slides is how industrialization is going to change all of that. So when we get into the factory system, uh, what we have are a lot of people who have moved from the farms, they've come into the cities. And so you're going to work in this big factory. It's a huge system with a lot of people you don't know. Uh, you don't own the means of production. In other words, you don't own the equipment or the machines that's making the goods. You're just simply a worker who comes in to, to do the work. And because of that, uh, you run into a lot of situations where, again, you're, you're coming in, you're working 12, 14 hours a day with a whole bunch of other people. And oftentimes the managers are you know, simply just paid by a corporation to come in and make sure everybody works. And they really don't care so much about you as a person you know, their job is to make sure that the bottom line is being met and that you're making a lot of profit. And so because of that, there's not going to necessarily be a good relationship oftentimes between the employers and the employees. And that's going to play itself out as we see here in just a moment. One of the problems with the factory systems is factories themselves were just very overcrowded. Uh, you know, the factory owners were just trying to make as much money as they could. So they, you know, got as many machines as they could afford got as many people as they could get to work in the machines. And they really, all they cared about for the most part was just making money. Now, obviously there's exceptions to that. There are a few good business owners, but several of the owners uh, just simply packed everybody in. It was often very dark, uh, often dirty. And uh, this particular scene that you see in this picture here, you can just see everyone's kind of packed in into this uh, cramped area. If you recall from a worksheet earlier, there was an account from a doctor who had visited a cotton mill where children were working, and he commented that it was so hot he could only stand to be in there for about 10 minutes, yet these children were working in there 12 to 14 hours a day. So one of the big problems, as I mentioned, is just going to be this overcrowdedness and the crampness and the dirtiness that you're working in day after day after day after day. For children, but for everyone especially, um, the, one of the problems is that you're just working all day long. Uh, typically, you go to work basically when the sun comes up and you're going home when the sun goes down. Uh, you know, in today's world, we have basically an eight hour work day, but in those days, it wasn't uncommon to work 12 or 14 hours a day. Children, we've talked about this before, ever since we've been talking about the Industrial Revolution, but the children were often higher because they you know, were smaller, could reach into the machines, but it was a very dangerous job for them, especially if you've been standing on your feet for 12 or 14 hours, because you tend to lose your focus, you reach in, and before you know it, you know, your finger's been ripped off or your uh, skin has been ripped down to the bone and things of that nature. So it's a very dangerous uh, job, especially considering the hours everyone was working. 
While the factory system was somewhat beneficial to women in the respect that they were able to gain a little bit of independence by moving into a city and you know earning a wage. So that's a little bit different than what they were able to do back in a domestic type of system. But the problem was uh, they were getting paid a lot less than men were. And that actually continued on for many, many, many years and still somewhat today. Uh, but as an employer, if you owned a factory, you could pay women and children less. And so that's why they liked to hire them. Consequently, the men in cities uh, were upset about this because men also needed jobs. And so they were losing a lot of their jobs because women and children were taking the jobs at the factory. And ever since the Industrial Revolution, the uh, fear of technology has been around. And the term you see here is technological unemployment. And basically what it's referring to here is that workers were basically being replaced by machines. Uh, in the past, if you recall, when we talked about the cottage industry, you know, people were spinning yarn and making fabrics and things of that nature, where now a machine could do that. And as machines progressed, you didn't need as many people uh, to do all the work and work them. As you see in this picture here, you got you know a woman and a child working this entire big row of this machine with the yarn. So this is going to be a situation that it will continue on even till today. You know, there are people who have fears that well, my job will be replaced by a robot or things of that nature. And you know, that's that's happened. Uh, auto workers, for instance, you know, machines and robots are putting cars together. Uh, and not needing as much help from individual human workforce. So this is definitely going to be a problem that's going to continue on as we go forward. Now, when you went to work for a factory, you obviously needed a place to live. And if you weren't in a city, uh, if you were working at a factory that was in a more rural area, then where you typically lived was a factory town. And what that is is where a business owner oftentimes when he built the factory would often build all the housing needed for the people who are going to work in the factory and along with that would often build a general store as well so that the people of the town would have a place to buy goods now this concept of of living in a factory town was not unusual because if you go back to feudalism days and things we talked about earlier in the year you know, it was quite common for people to live on someone else's property. You lived on the Lord's estate and, you know, the Lord let you live there as long as you farmed and gave the Lord some of, you know, what you farmed and those kind of things. So this was an unusual uh, kind of concept for them. But what was a little bit different and made factory towns kind of rough for some people is that um, oftentimes you were paid with money that had to be used in the company store. And sometimes as well, depending on the town or the store, or the company store, you could uh, buy things on credit there as well. So if you needed to purchase something, you could purchase it on credit and then you would have to work off, you know, whatever it is you owed. So a lot of workers were often in debt to the factory, which meant that they couldn't leave their jobs because they still owed money. So it almost turned out to be some type of servitude in essence, because you owed money uh, to the factory store. Uh, or company stores that was often called. There's a uh, famous song by Tennessee Ernie Ford called 16 Tons. And it's talking about him. There's a line in it where he says, I owe my soul to the company store, meaning that he, you know, he's in debt to this company, to this factory area where he can't, can't leave. Uh, if you want a good example to see kind of what, what that was like, there's a place in Stearns, Kentucky, which is only a couple hours away from here where you can go and take a train ride, which will take you to the Blue Heron coal mining camp. And so this was a place obviously where they, it wasn't necessarily a factory per se, but coal mining, but they had um, housing that was built in a company store and things of that nature. So if you ever get a chance, head up that way, it's a great trip. Now, if you worked in a factory in a city, the more than likely you lived in what was referred to as a tenement. And that's a building that has a lot of uh, basically apartments, but it's a different kind of than what we think of today. You know, the apartments are some of them very nice, very luxurious kind of apartments. In these days, tenements were often very overcrowded, very small, very unsanitary. As you see in the picture here, um, the you know this is a family that's crowded into the small little space, and that's pretty much you know going to be their living room and kitchen. They luckily might have another bedroom 
uh, where people can sleep. Oftentimes you were sleeping four or five people to a bed. Um, now in this particular picture, it appears to be fairly sanitary as far as the tenement itself. Uh, you are dealing with issues of, and we've talked about this in class as far as, you know, you don't have indoor plumbing and things of that nature. So you can imagine some of the unsanitary aspects of that. Uh, if you ever get a chance, if you're in New York City, there's um, tours that you can take where you can see tenement uh, buildings. I went on one of those tours and it's just a very eye-opening experience. And as I've said many, many times to you before, you know, be very thankful you live in the world you live at the time period you live because we have it very fortunate uh, where we live today. But as you can tell, workers were, you know, kind of unsatisfied both places. You go into the factory, you're working long hours, it's hot, it's dangerous, you come home, you're in a crowded, unsanitary place. So it wasn't a very pleasant life, unfortunately, for them back then. So if you're unhappy with the way things are going, especially in your job, what do you do? Well, before um, labor unions, Basically, your only option was to bargain yourself individually, go to your boss and try to bargain for better working conditions and better pay and things of that nature. And you could do that if you were, you know, a skilled craftsman and you, you know, were very valuable. So if in this picture you see uh, these are cobblers, people who make shoes. And if you were very good at what you did, you could go to your boss and ask for more pay. And if he thought you were good enough, he'd give you more pay. Um, but the problem is once you get into factory work, you know, factory work is something that can pretty much be done by anyone. So, you know, if you're, if you're complaining and wanting more pay, the boss would just simply get rid of you and put someone else in your place. And so you're easily placed so you didn't have a lot of power to bargain to make anything better. So since individual bargaining wouldn't really work well in the factory system, uh, what people started doing was coming together as a group, as a collective. And they started bargaining as a group rather than as one. And this is a term we refer to as collective bargaining. And so what would happen is you would organize a group of workers, you would elect leaders to then go to management and argue on your behalf. And some of the things you might threaten to a factory owner is that if you don't meet our demands, we're going to go on strike, which means you're not going to work. You see a picture um, down in the bottom left where you have some men that are on strike and they're holding picket signs. So typically when you see a picket sign, that's often referring to some sort of strike when you're looking at old pictures. And so labor unions are going to form during this time. And this is going to be what really changes uh, the Industrial Revolution and changes the way our world is, is because these groups come together and they fight for the rights of everyone in the group. Now I added this uh, cartoon in here because it really kind of gives us a visual of what was going on at the time. And if you read the caption at the bottom, it says, the hand that will rule the world, one big union. And what you have are a lot of um, people all coming together, making a fist, and it rises as one gigantic hand. And it's really um, illustrative of how the people believe that if we can, we can come together, then we have power as one. And so this is going to be a hugely important thing, as I mentioned, as we head forward, because it's going to change the way that business is done. It's also going to lead to some major political and economic changes, especially in Russia. And we're going to be talking about that here fairly soon with uh, communism and the uh, communist manifesto with Karl Marx and things of that nature. So, uh, again, just an excellent, excellent cartoon to kind of illustrate this concept of everyone coming together to be able to have strength and power to fight against big business. All right, so what we have here are some of the weapons or threats, you might say, that could be used by both sides. So when you're arguing with the other side, these are some of the things you might pull out to win or to influence the other side to get what you want. Now for the employers, some of the threats that they might use or some of the tools in their tool bag, so to speak, they could use were things, and we won't go through the entire list, but just a few I'll point out to you, some things like at-will employment. What at-will employment is, is when you're hired, you sign a contract stating that you understand this is an at-will job, meaning that the owner, the employer, can fire you at will. And what that means is they can come and fire you just because they feel like it. Uh, for instance, teachers, 
are uh, working at will jobs, at least for their first uh, few years. There's a thing with teaching called tenure, um, and that's going away in some states. But tenure kind of protects teachers from being fired just because drop of a hat, you know, someone wants to fire them. Um, but for the first few years at teaching, a principal can just walk into your room any day and just say you're fired. They don't have to give you any reason and you have no recourse. There's nothing you can do because it's an at will job. Uh, blacklist are things that employers would do where if you uh, were complaining or you were a threat to the company, uh, business owners would let other business owners know and so no one would hire you. And so you were, you were considered blacklisted. So if your name was on the blacklist, that was a bad thing, meant that no one was going to hire you. And so uh, some of the other things I may point out here, uh, threat of foreign competition. You know, this is something that, you know, especially with immigrants moving from other places, they could usually be hired cheaply. And so as an employer, you would tell the person who's trying to bargain with you that you, know, you might want to think twice about bargaining because I could easily fire you and hire someone, you know, from a foreign place, an immigrant for a lot cheaper. Uh, yellow dog contracts there at the bottom is interesting as well. It's basically uh, where you sign uh, when you are hired that you will not join a union. And so they refer to that as a yellow dog. Welfare, capitalism, and go up one just for this last one here. That's basically, it's kind of a little different. Not so much of a threat, it's more of a, uh, of a promise in essence in that the business would say that they would give you you know, better working conditions, perhaps offer some type of welfare system, something that's going to take care of you. Um, so they would do that kind of in, in exchange sometimes for other things you might be bargaining. So it's kind of like if you if you're wanting this, uh, we'll give you that, but we have to take away a dental plan or, you know, if you don't ask for that, we might be able to give you some basic health care or things of that nature. So when you flip it over to the other side, to the um, to the employees, the unions, you know, they had a variety of threats or weapons they could do. And again, we won't go through the whole list. Uh, boycotts, basically, where they, you know, refuse to buy something. They're going to boycott something. Uh, some other things that were but probably the most common, the one you really need to know are, um, you know, strikes. Strikes is going to be a huge valuable tool for unions because what a strike is, is when you threat, threaten, excuse me, to not work. So there have been a lot of strikes. There's, uh, there's been police strikes and teacher strikes and air traffic controller strikes and all sorts of things like that, bus driver strikes. And so if you're not getting what you want and the um, company's not working with you, then you just threaten to go on strike and People just don't show up for work. And so obviously if nobody's working, then the company is not making money. And some companies will give in to strikes and other companies will, in essence, fire everyone and try to hire people all over again. So it's even happened in the NFL and in baseball. So, you know, it, it strikes pervade all sports, all businesses, all kinds of things where people are bargaining, trying to get something better. So basically, that's, that's the big one to remember here for the unions. Now, this timeline of event has several things on it. I'm just going to point out a few things that are uh, kind of a note here. If you'll notice at the very first, 1799, 1800, basically in England, uh, unions and strikes were outlawed. It was against the law to do that. And as industrial revolution kind of takes hold and you've got more and more factories and more and more unsatisfied workers and labor unions being formed, you're going to see a push for those kind of things changing. You notice in 1900, the Labor Party's founded. And pretty much after then, you're going to have a group, a government political group that is working to make things better for the workers. And so the Labor Party is going to become fairly uh, popular and powerful. And you notice by 1920, they're going to surpass the Liberal Party in power. And so um, when you get to the 40s and beyond, as you see at the bottom, the Labor Party is really going to work hard to increase um, things that are for the welfare of the worker, social programs, getting medicine and health care for people, and making sure that things are 
at least a little more equal for people that are working and that the government's doing a job of regulating businesses to make sure they're not abusing their workers. So one of the things that was a big push uh, for the workers was, especially the women workers, was for, uh, an, in essence, an eight-hour work day. As we talked about before, oftentimes you're working 12, 14 hours. If you were a, a woman in particular who you know, was also taking care of a family, you were still expected to cook when you got home and do cleaning and take care of the kids and all those kinds of things as well. So um, as you see in this cartoon here, it kind of summarizes what they were after. And they were, you know, wanting, you know, let us work eight hours, you know, let us rest eight hours. And for those eight hours in between, let us do what we want to do. And so you'll notice uh, you have a little uh, man in the bottom right, kind of almost with a picket sign for eight hours. And this is what we have today. We now have an eight hour work day. Now, obviously you can work longer than that. But basically, the way our rules are here in the United States is if you are paid by the hour, then uh, you can work up to 40 hours a week, which is eight hours, five days a week. And then if you work more than that, the company has to pay you extra. So if you ever work overtime at your job and get a little extra pay, you need to thank uh, the people that fought for the eight hour work day several, several, several years ago for you. Now, another thing that's going to take place is uh, you're going to start seeing children working less and less in factories. Uh, just the more that the government gets involved and more that regulators come in and see that the dangerous conditions they're working in, uh, they start um, doing things to kind of protect children more. Also, as we talked about earlier, men were complaining about women and children taking all the jobs. So men are going to start getting back into the factory work and children are going to be pulled out of the factory. So because of that, you're going to also see during this time a rise of schools and required attendance for the children to go to school. So this is going to obviously give a place for the children to go during the day. It's also going to help them learn how to read uh, and again, we've talked about this before. There's kind of different views as to why they wanted that. Uh, for many, it was for religious reasons. You wanted children to be able to read so they could read the Bible. Uh, but also just basic enlightenment ideals. Uh, we've talked about the enlightenment before. And one of the ideas is that if you can read, you can understand uh, these kind of thoughts on what's going on in your world. So you can be an active participant in your world and help to change the world and make it a better place. Uh, so school is going to become a central element kind of going forward. Uh, one of the reasons why today you're required to go to school. And that's not a bad thing. And again, you know, while you may not w wish to always be at school, if you're in other parts of the world, even today, uh, and saw what they have to go through or saw how much they wish they could be in school, you would probably appreciate what you have right now. So again, very lucky to live where you live at the time you live. Some big things that happen here, uh, you're going to have some health and safety codes. And that's basically where the government's going to regulate uh, some factories, businesses, and make sure that things are being done uh, safely. Uh, there were a lot of problems in the past, not only just working in factories, but also just sanitary wise. Um, there's a book called The Jungle by Upton Sinclair that we have in our library if you ever wish to read it. Uh, many people who read it say they'll never eat, you know, sausages or hot dogs or things like that again because it's a fictional book, but it deals with the meat packing industry in Chicago and how unsanitary it was. And although it's a fiction book, it was based off some true things and actually led to some of the health and safety codes we have in America today. It's a very powerful book, uh, but the time during this is going to be when you know unions are calling for better working conditions safer working conditions the government gets involved and they start realizing you know we need to have regulations we need to make sure people are doing things right um, to put it in perspective in schools one of the reasons we have uh, fire drills once a month is because of safety codes and making sure that we're you know going to keep you protected and you know what to do in case of a fire some other things that happened during this time too is the establishment of a minimum wage 
so that everyone's being paid at least a minimum salary, which hopefully is enough for them to survive and get by. And they've also uh, legalized unions, as we saw earlier in uh, the United Kingdom, that uh, at a period of time around the 1800s, unions were illegal. But at this point, uh, they have finally you know, made those legal. And so there are several unions that are going to pop up uh, to protect different types of workers. So it's kind of a recap on some of the things we talked about a little bit new here as well that um, you know, basically women and children could legally be paid less. And that was one of the reasons business owners like to hire them uh, because they could you know, save money by hiring women and children, which caused the male workers to be resentful uh, because they were losing out on jobs. Uh, the child workers, especially in England uh, for many, many, many years, uh, had very rough conditions. Um, sometimes there were children as, as low as young, I should say as five years old, uh, sometimes even younger working in factories. And the thing, if you were in a poor family, especially, uh, you know, if you were a mother working in a factory, but you had no one to take care of your child, then oftentimes your child came with you to the factory. So they were in these very hot, dirty, cramped conditions that we talked about earlier. So it's not a good situation for them. Uh, so when we have the labor unions early on, you know, many of the labor unions were uh, unions by men and they were trying to get rid of uh, women and children being able to work in the workplace. Now that's not going to work. And so they kind of abandoned that idea. Children, for the most part, start, you know, getting moved out of the workplace, but women continue to work. And eventually they're going to win the right for equal pay. Uh, that's going to come quite a bit later. And though even today, they're still, unfortunately, even though, you know, women should be paid the same amount as men, there's often situations where uh, women are not. And that is illegal in today's world. So if you are a woman, be very thankful for the people before you who fought to get you equal pay because you definitely deserve it. And it's a shame that you didn't have it before. And our final slide here is just kind of a, a quick overview of uh, social insurance or security, basically things that the government is doing to protect you, uh, provide for you as you get older. And it's broken down to some of the European countries as well as ourselves in the United States. And what's interesting, and we won't go through each one, but uh, basically, you know, accident or sickness, having some sort of protection there where, you know, you get a little bit of pay if you are hurt or injured or out sick for a while. You'll notice for most of the countries, it's late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, for United States, it kind of varies by state. If you recall in eighth grade, when we talked about federalism and the idea of, you know, you have a national federal government that makes laws, but it also shares power with the states where they can also make laws. That's why we see, you know, varies by state here, because some of these things were decided by individual states and they obviously vary. Uh, but one that's interesting or I think it's interesting to look at is socialized medicine. And this is something uh, you see in the news a lot. You see a lot of negative things back and forth on it. Uh, you hear it referred to as Obamacare, though the idea had come, had come up prior to Obama, uh, but it did get enacted with him. But basically this is uh, the idea that everyone in your society, in your culture should have access to health care. And in the situation prior to that, not everyone did. It was a situation where if you worked a job, you got health care. Uh, if you didn't, you had to purchase it. And a lot of people weren't able to purchase it. And so with the system that we have now, that doesn't totally cover everyone still, uh, but it's a little bit better than what it was before. But what's interesting is kind of compare it to France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy. You'll notice they were all doing that type of thing from right after World War II, if not before, especially in the case of Germany, they've been providing health care for their citizens. Um, ironically, we're one of the uh, last countries, as far as modern countries, to offer social health care for our citizens. And there are arguments, good arguments, both sides of you know why we should or why it's not a good idea. Um, so that's kind of more of a debate for another day and political debate as well. But the interesting thing about it is just noticing, you know, it's almost half a century later before we decide to do that in our country. So 
<clears throat> this just kind of wraps up everything that we talked about with the labor movement. Hopefully you can see that from the beginning where we started, where there basically were not any rights at all for people uh, to where we're wrapping up here, uh, you know, quite a bit changed during this time because of collective bargaining and labor unions and people fighting for their rights and demanding that they get taken care of. So, you know, this labor movement had a huge influence on the world we know today. And all of us should be very thankful, those of us that have jobs, uh, for it because it makes our life a lot more bearable than what it was, sadly, 100 years ago. So that wraps it up. As always, if you have any questions, just let us know.